Section 11 of Astounding Stories 6, June 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zach Brewster Geis. Astounding Story 6, June 1930. Section 11. Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings. Chapters 34 through 35. Chapter 34. The First Encounters. The besieged Earthmen wage grim, ultra-scientific war with Martian bandits in a last great struggle for their radium ore and their lives. It seemed with that first shot from the enemy that a great relief came to me, an apprehension fallen away. We had anticipated this moment for so long, dreaded it. I think all our men felt it. A shout went up. Harmless! It was not that. But our building was stood at better than I had feared. It was a flash from a large electronic projector mounted on the deck of the brigand ship. It stabbed up from the shadows across the valley at the foot of the opposite crater wall, a beam of vaguely fluorescent light. Simultaneously the searchlight vanished. The stream of electrons caught the front face of our main building in a six-foot circle. It held a few seconds, vanished, then stabbed again, and still again. Three bolts. A total, I suppose, of nine or ten seconds. I was standing with Grantline at a front window. We had rigged an oblong of insulated fabric like a curtain. We stood peering, holding the curtain cautiously aside. The ray struck some twenty feet away from us. Harmless! The men in the room shouted it with derision, but Grantline swung on them. Don't think that! An interior signal panel was beside Grantline. He called the duty men in the instrument room. It's over. What are your readings? The bombarding electrons had passed through the outer shell of the building's double wall and been absorbed into the rarefied magnetized air current of the errant circulation. Like poison in a man's veins reaching his heart, the free alien electrons had disturbed the motors. They accelerated, then retarded, pulsed unevenly, and drew added power from the reserve tanks, but they had normalized at once when the shot was passed. The duty man's voice sounded from the grid in answer to Grantline's question. Five degrees colder in your building. Can't you feel it? The disturbed, weakened errant circulation had allowed the outer cold to radiate through a trifle. The walls had had a trifle extra explosive pressure from the room air, a strain, but that was all. It's probably their most powerful single weapon, Greg, Grantline said. I nodded. Yes, I think so. I had smashed the real giant with its ten-mile range. The ship was only two miles from us, but it seemed as though this projector were exerted to its distance limit. I had noticed on the deck only one of this type. The others, paralyzing rays and heat rays, were less deadly. Grantline commented, We can withstand a lot of that bombardment. If we stay inside... That ray striking a man outside would penetrate his errant suit within a few seconds, we could not doubt. We had, however, no intention of going out unless for dire necessity. Even so, said Grantline, a hand shield would hold it off for a certain length of time. We had an opportunity a moment later to test our insulated shields. The bolt came again. It darted along the front face of the building, caught our window, and clung. The double window shells were our weakest points. The sheet of flashing errant's current was transparent. We could see through it as though it were glass. It moved faster, but was thinner at the windows than in the walls. We feared the bombarding electrons might cross it, penetrate the inner shell, and, like a lightning bolt, enter the room. We dropped the curtain corner. The radiance of the bolt was dimly visible. A few seconds, then it vanished again, and behind the shield we had not felt a tingle. Harmless! But our power had been drained nearly an aeron to neutralize the shock to the errant's current. Grantline said, If they kept that up, it would be a question of whose power supply would last longest, and it would not be ours. You saw our lights fade down while the bolt was striking? But the brigands did not know we were short of power, and to fire the projector with a continuous bolt would, in thirty minutes perhaps, have exhausted their own power reserve. This strange warfare! It was new to all of us, for there had been no wars on any of the three inhabited worlds for many years. Silent electronic conflict! 
not a question of men in battle. A man at a switch on the brigand ship was the sole actor so far in this assault, and the results were visible only in the movement of the needle dials on our instrument panels, a struggle so far, not of man's bravery, or skill, or strategy, but merely of electronic power supply. Yet warfare, however modern, can never transcend the human element. Before this insult was ended, I was to have many demonstrations of that. "'I won't answer them,' Grantline declared. "'Our game is to sit defensive. Conserve everything. Let them make the leading moves.' We waited half an hour, but no other shot came. The valley floor was patched with earthlight and shadow. We could see the vague outline of the brigand ship backed up at the foot of the opposite crater wall. The form of its dome over the illuminated deck was visible, and the line of its tiny hull ovals. On the rocks near the ship, helmet lights of prowling brigands occasionally showed. Whatever activity was going on down there, we could not see it with the naked eye. Grantline did not use our telescope at first. To connect it, even for local range, drew on our precious ammunition of power. Some of the men urged that we search the sky with the telescope. Was our rescue ship from Earth coming? But Grantline refused. We were in no trouble yet, and every delay was to our advantage. Commander, where shall I put these helmets? A man came wheeling a pile of helmets on a little truck. At the manual port. Other building. Our weapons and outside equipment were massed at the main exit locks of the large building, but we might want to sally out through the smaller locks also. Grantline sent helmets there. Suits were not needed, as most of us were garbed in them now, but without the helmets. Snap was still in the workshop. I went there during the first half hour of the attack. Ten of our men were busy there, with the little flying platforms and the fabric shields. How is it, Snap? Almost all ready. He had six of the platforms, including the one we had already used, and more than a dozen hand shields. At a squeeze, all of us could ride on these six little vehicles— we might have to ride them. We planned that, in the event of disaster to the buildings, we could at least escape in this fashion. Food supplies and water were now being placed at the ports. Depressing preparations. Our buildings uninhabitable, a rush out and away, abandoning the treasure. Grantline had never mentioned such a contingency, but I noticed, nevertheless, that preparations were being made. Only that one shot, Greg? Snap's voice was raised over the clang of the workmen bolting the little gravity plates of the last platform. Four blasts, but just the one projector. They're strongest. He grinned. He wore no errant suit as yet. He stood in torn, grimy work trousers and a bedraggled shirt, with the inevitable red eyeshade holding back his unruly hair. Around his waist was the weighted belt, and there were weights on his shoes for gravity stability. Didn't hurt us much. No. When I get the tube panels in this thing, I'll be finished. It'll take another half hour. I'll join you. Where are you stationed? I shrugged. I was at a front window with Johnny. Nothing to do as yet. Snap went back to his work. Well, the longer they delay, the better for us. If only your signal got through, Greg. We'll have a rescue ship here in a few hours more. Ah, that if. I turned away. Can't help you, Snap? No. Take those shields, he added to one of the men. Take them where? To Grantline, the front admission port or the back. He'll tell you which. The shields were wheeled away on a little cart. I followed it. Grantline sent it to the back exit. No other move from them yet, Johnny? No. All quiet. Snap's almost finished. The brigands presently made another play. A giant heat ray beam came across the valley. It clung to our front wall for nearly a minute. Grantline got the reports from the instrument room. He laughed. That helped rather than hurt us. He did the outer wall. Frank took advantage of it and eased up the motors. We wondered if Miko knew that. Doubtless he did, for another interval passed and the heat ray was not used again. Then came a zed ray. I stood at the window, watching it, faint sheen of beam in the dimness. It crept with sinister deliberation along our front building wall, clung momentarily to our shielded windows, and pried with its revealing glow into Snap's workshop. "'Looking us over,' Grantline commented. "'I hope they like what they see.' 
I knew he did not feel the bravado that was in his tone. We had nothing but small hand weapons, heat rays, electronic projectors, and bullet projectors, all for very short-range fighting. If Miko had not known that before, he could at least make a good guess at it after the careful Z-ray inspection. With his ship down there two miles away, we were powerless to reach him. It seemed that Miko was now testing the use of all his mechanisms. A light flare went up from the dome peak of the ship. It rose in a slow arc over the valley and burst. For a few seconds the two-mile circle of crags was brilliantly illumined. I stared, but I had to shield my eyes against the dazzling actinic glare and I could see nothing. Was Miko making a Z-ray photograph of our interiors? We had no way of knowing. He was testing his short-range projectors now. With my eyes again accustomed to the normal earthlight in the valley, I could see the stabs of little electronic beams, the Martian paralyzing rays and heat beams. They darted out like flashing swords from the rocks near the ship. Then the whole ship and the crater wall behind it seemed to shift sidewise as a Benson curve light spread its glow about the ship with a projector curve beam coming up and touching the window through which I was peering. Haljan, come look at these damn girls! Commander, shall I stop them? They'll kill themselves, or kill us, or smash something!" We followed the man into the building's broad central corridor. Anita and Venza were riding a midget flying platform. Anita in her boyish black garb, Venza with a flowing white Venus robe. They lay on the tiny six-foot oblong of metal, one manipulating its side shields, the other at the controls. As we arrived, the platform came sliding down the narrow confines of the corridor, lurching, barely missing a door-grid projection, up to skim the low-vaulted ceiling, then down to the floor. It sailed past our heads, rising over us as we ducked. Anita waved her hand. Grantline gasped. "'By the infernal!' I shouted. "'Anita, stop!' but they only waved at us, skimming down the length of the corridor, seeming to avoid a smash a dozen times by the smallest margin of chance, stopping miraculously at the further end, hanging poised in midair, wheeling, coming back, undulating up and down. Grantline clung to me. By the gods of the airways! In spite of my astonished horror, I could not but share Grantline's obvious admiration. Three or four other men were watching. The girls were amazingly skillful, no doubt of that. There was not a man among us who could have handled that gravity platform indoors, not one who would have had the brash temerity to try it. The platform landed with the grace of a hummingbird at our feet, the girls dexterously balancing so that it came to rest swiftly without the least bump. I confronted them. Anita, what are you doing? She stood up, flushed and smiling. Practicing? Imperturbable girls! the product of their age, oblivious to the brigand attack, they were in here practicing. "'What for?' I demanded. Venza's roguish eyes twinkled at me. Her hands went to her slim hips with a gesture of defiance. She asked, "'Are you speaking for yourself or the commander?' I ignored her. "'What for?' I reiterated. "'Because we're good at it,' Anita retorted. "'Better than any of you men. If you should need us—' "'We don't. We won't.' I said shortly. But if you should, Venza put in, if Snap and I hadn't come for you, you wouldn't be here, Greg Haljan. I didn't notice you were so horrified to see me holding that shield up over you. It silenced me. She added, Commander, let us alone. We won't smash anything. Grantline laughed. I hope you won't. A warning call took us back to the front window. The brigand's search beam was again being used. It swept slowly along the length of the cliff. Its circle went down the cliff steps to the valley floor and came sweeping up again. Then it went up to the observatory platform at the summit above us, then back and crept over to the ore sheds. We had no men outside if that was what the brigand wanted to determine. The search beam presently vanished. It was replaced immediately by a Z-ray, which darted at once to our treasure sheds and clung. That stung Grantline into his first action. We flung our own Z-ray down across the valley. It reached the brigand ship. This Z-ray and a searchlight were our only two projectors of long range. The brigand ray vanished when ours flashed on. I was with Grantline at an image grid in the instrument room. We saw the deck of the brigand ship and the blurred interior of the cabins. Try the search beam, Frank, 
We don't need the other. The Zed Ray went off. We gazed down our searchlight which clung to the dome of the distant enemy vessel. We could see movement there. The telescope, Grantline ordered. The little dynamos hummed. The telescope finder glowed and clarified. On the deck of the ship we saw the brigands working with the assembling of ore carts. A deck landing port was open. The ore carts were being carried out through a port lock and down a landing incline. And on the rocks outside we saw several of the carts, and rail sections, and the sections of an ore chute. Miko was unloading his mining apparatus. He was making ready to come up for the treasure. The discovery, startling as it was, nevertheless was far overshadowed by an imperative danger alarm from our main building. Brigands were outside on our ledge. Miko's search beam, sweeping the ledge a moment before, had carefully avoided revealing them. It had been done just for that purpose, no doubt, making us sure that the ledge was unoccupied and thus to guard against our own light making a search. But there was a brigand group here close outside our walls. By the merest chance the radiating glow from our search ray had shown the helmeted figures scurrying for shelter. Grantline leaped to his feet. We rushed for the rear exit port which was nearest us. The giant, bloated figures had been seen running along the outside of the connecting corridor in this direction. But before we ever got there a new alarm came. A brigand was crouching at a front corner of the main building. His hydrogen heat torch had already opened a rift in the wall. Chapter 35 Desperate Offensive "'In with you,' ordered Grantline. "'Get your helmets on. How many? Six? Enough. Get back there, Williams. You are last. The lock won't hold any more.' I was one of the six who jammed into the manual exit lock. We went through it. In a moment we were outside. It was less than three minutes since the prowling brigands had been seen. Grantline touched me just as we emerged. "'Don't wait for orders. Get them!' "'That fellow with the torch, the most dangerous. Yes.' I'm with you." We went out with a rush. We had already discarded our shoe and belt weights. I leaped, regardless of my companions. The scurrying Martians had disappeared. Through my visor bullseye I could see only the earth-lit rocky surface of the ledge. Beside me stretched the dark wall of our building. I bounded toward the front. The brigand with the torch had been at this front corner. I could not see him from here. He had been crouching just around the angle. I had a tiny bullet projector, the best weapon for short-range outdoors. I was aware of Grantline close behind me. It took only a few of my giant leaps. I landed at the corner, recovered my balance, and whirled around to the front. The Martian was here, a giant misshapen lump as he crouched. His torch was a little stab of blue in the deep shadow enveloping him. Intent upon his work, he did not see me. Perhaps he thought his fellows had broken our exits by now. I landed like a leopard upon his back and fired my weapon muzzle ramming him. His torch fell hissing with a silent rain of blue fire upon the rocks. As my grip upon him made audiophone contact, his agonized scream rattled the diaphragms of my ear grids with horrible, deafening intensity. He lay writhing under me, then was still. His scream choked into silence. His suit deflated within my encircling grip. He was dead. My leaden, steel-tipped pellet had punctured the double surface of his errand's fabric, penetrated his chest. Grantline's following leap landed him over me. Dead? Yes. I climbed from the inert body. The torch had hissed itself out. Grantline swung on our building corner, and I leaned down with him to examine it. The torch had fused and scarred the surface of the wall, burned almost through. A pressure rift had opened. We could see it, a curving gash in the metal wall plate like a crack in a glass window pane. I went cold. This was serious damage. The rarefied Aaron's air would seep out. It was leaking now. We could see the magnetic radiance of it all up the length of the ten-foot crack. The leak would change the pressure of the Aaron's system, constantly lower it, demanding steady renewal. The Aaron's motors would overheat. Some might go bad from the strain. Grantline stood gripping me. Damn bad. Yes. Can't we repair it, Johnny? No. Have to take that whole plate section out, shut off the Aaron's plant, and exhaust the interior air of all this bulkhead of the building. Day's job. Maybe more. And the crack would get worse, I knew. It would gradually spread and widen. The Aaron's circulation would fail. All our power would be drained, struggling to maintain it. This brigand who had unwittingly committed suicide by his daring act had accomplished more than he perhaps had realized. 
I could envisage our weapons, useless from lack of power, the air in our buildings turning fetid and frigid, ourselves forced to the helmets, a rush out to abandon the camp and escape, the buildings exploding, scattering into a litter on the ledge like a child's broken toy, the treasure abandoned with the brigands coming up and loading it on their ship. Our defeat, in a few hours now, or minutes. This crack could slowly widen, or it could break suddenly at any time. Disaster, come now so abruptly upon us at the very start of the brigand attack. Grantline's voice in my audiphone broke my despairing rush of thoughts. Bad. Come on, Greg. Nothing to do here. We were aware that our other four men had run along the building's other side. They emerged now, with the running brigands in front of them rushing out toward the staircase on the ledge. Three giant Martian figures in flight, with our four men chasing. A bullet projector spat with its queer stab of exploding power fed by the burning oxygen fumes of its artificial air chamber, one of our men firing. A brigand fell to the rocks by the brink of the ledge. The others reached the descending staircase, tumbled down it with reckless leaps. Our men turned back. Before we could join them, the enemy ship down in the valley sent up a cautious search beam which located its returning men. Then the beam swung up to the ledge, landed upon us. We stood confused, blinded by the brilliant glare. Grantline stumbled against me. Run, Greg! They'll be firing at us! We dashed away. Our companions joined us, rushing back for the port. I saw it open, reinforcements coming out to help us, half a dozen figures carrying a ten-foot insulated shield. They could barely get it out through the port. The Martian search ray abruptly vanished. Then almost instantly the electronic ray came with its deadly stab. Missed us at first as we ran for the shield. It vanished and then stabbed again. It caught us, but now we were behind the shield, carrying it back to the port, hiding behind it. The ray stabbed once or twice more. Whether Miko's instruments showed him how serious that damage was to our front wall, we never knew. But I think that he realized. His search beam clung to it, and his Z-ray pried into our interiors. The brigand ship was active now. We were desperate. We used our telescope freely for observation, and used our Z-ray and searchlight. Miko's ore carts and mining apparatus were unloaded on the rocks. The rail sections were being carried a mile out, nearly to the center of the valley. A subsidiary camp was being established there, only a mile from the base of our cliff, but still far beyond reach of our weapons. We could see the brigand lights down there. Then the ore chute sections were brought over. We could see Miko's men carrying some of the giant projectors, mounting them in the new position. Power tanks and cables, light flare catapults, little mechanical cannons for throwing the bombs. The enemy searchlight constantly raked our vicinity. Occasionally the giant electronic projector flung up its bolt, as though warning us not to dare leave our buildings. Half an hour went by. Our situation was even worse than Miko could know. The errant's motors were running hot, our power draining, the crack widening. When it would break, we could not tell, but the danger was like a sword over us. An anxious thirty minutes for us, this second interlude. Grantline called a meeting of all our little force, with every man having his say. Inactivity was no longer a feasible policy. We recklessly used our power to search the sky. Our rescue ship might be up there, but we could not see it with our disabled instruments. No signals came. We could not, or at least did not, receive them. They wouldn't signal, Grantline protested. They'd know the Martians would be more likely to get the signal than us. Of what use to warn Miko? But he did not dare wait for a rescue ship that might or might not be coming. Miko was playing the waiting game now, making ready for a quick loading of the ore when we were forced to abandon our buildings. The brigand ship suddenly moved its position. It rose up in a low, flat arc, came forward and settled in the center of the valley where the carts and rail sections were piled and the outside projectors newly mounted on the rocks. But the projectors only shot at us occasionally. The brigands now began laying the rails from the ship toward the base of our cliff. The chute would bring the ore down from the ledge, and the carts would take it to the ship. The laying of the rails was done under cover of occasional stabs from the electronic projector. And then we discovered that Miko had made still another move. The brigand rays, fired from the depths of the valley, could strike our front building, but could not reach all our ledge. 
and from the ship's new and nearer position this disadvantage was intensified. Then abruptly we realized that under cover of the darkness bombs an electronic projector and search ray had been carried to the top of the crater rim, diagonally across and only half a mile from us. Their beams shot down, raking all our vicinity from this new angle. I was on the little flying platform which sallied out as a test to attack these isolated projectors. Snap and I and one other volunteer went. He and I held the shield. Snap handled the controls. Our exit port was on the lee side of the building from the hostile search beam. We got out unobserved and sailed upward. But soon a light from the ship caught us, and the projector bolts came up. Our sortie only lasted a few minutes. To me it was a confusion of crossing beams, with the stars overhead, the swaying little platform under me, and the shield tingling in my hands when the blast struck us. Moments of blurred terror. The voice of the man beside me sounded in my ears. Now, Haljan, give them one. We were up over the peak of the rim with the hostile projectors under us. I gauged our movement and dropped an explosive powder bomb. It missed. It flared with a puff on the rocks twenty feet from where the two projectors were mounted. I saw that two helmeted figures were down there. They tried to swing their grids upward, but could not get them vertical to reach us. The ship was firing at us, but it was far away, and Grantline's search beam was going full power, clinging to the ship to dazzle them. Snap circled us. As we came back I dropped another bomb. Its silent puff seemed littered with flying fragments of the two projectors and the bodies of the men. We flew swiftly back and got in. It decided Grantline. For an hour past, Snap and I had been urging our plan to use the grab platforms. To remain inactive was sure defeat now. Even if our buildings did not explode, if we thought to huddle in them, helmeted in the failing air, then Miko could readily ignore us and proceed with his loading of the treasure under our helpless gaze. He could do that now with safety, if we refused to sally out, for we could not fire our weapons through our windows. Footnote. To fire a projector through the walls or windows would at once wreck the protective errant system. The enemy ship has pressure ports constructed for the emission of the weapon rays. Grantline's only weapons thus mounted were his search beam and Zed ray. End of footnote. To remain defensive would end inevitably in our defeat. We all knew it now. It was obvious. The waiting game was Miko's, not ours, and he was playing it. The success of our attack upon the distant isolated projectors heartened us, yet it was a desperate offensive indeed upon which we now decided. We prepared our little expedition at the larger of the exit ports. Miko Zedray was watching all our interior movements. We made a brave show of activity in our workshop with abandoned ore carts, which were sorted there. We got them out, started to recondition them. It seemed to fool Miko. His Zed Ray clung to the workshop, watching us, and at the distant port we gathered the little platforms, the shields, helmets, bombs, and a few hand projectors. There were six platforms, three of us upon each. It left four people to remain indoors. I need not describe the emotion with which Snap and I listened to Venza and Anita pleading to be allowed to accompany us. They urged it upon Grantline, and we took no part. It was too important a decision. The treasure, the life or death of all these men, hung now upon the fate of our venture. Snap and I could not intrude our personal feelings. And the girls won. Both were undeniably more skillful at handling the midget platforms than any of us men. Two of the six platforms could be guided by them. That was a third of our little force. And of what use to go out and be defeated, leaving the girls here to meet death almost immediately afterward? We gathered at the port. A last-minute change made Grantline order six of his men to remain guarding the buildings. The instruments, the errant system, all the appliances had to be attended. It left four platforms, each with three men, with Grantline at the controls of one of them, and upon the other two of the six, Venza rode with Snap and I with Anita. We crouched in the shadows outside the port, so small an army sallying out to bomb this enemy vessel or be killed in the attempt, only sixteen of us and thirty or so brigands. I envisaged then this tiny moon crater, the scene of this battle we were waging, struggling humans desperately trying to kill. Alone here on this globe, 
around us the wide reaches of lunar desolation. In all this world every human being was gathered here, struggling to kill. Anita drew me down to the platform. Ready, Greg. The others were rising. We lifted, moved slowly out and away from the protective shadows of the building. In a tiny queue, the six little platforms sailed out over the valley toward the brigand ship. End of Section 11, Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings, Chapter 34-35